Welcome back to The Different Knock. So, Tuesday was fun, wasn't it? Vamos! <laughs> Despite Arsenal yet again taking years off my life, we came out of Kenilworth Road with all three points thanks to this man, Declan Rice. Never before in my life have I fallen in love with an Arsenal player so quickly. And considering the level of scrutiny over the fees of the other players in this list of the top 10 record transfers, when compared to the absence of scrutiny over Declan's fee in the media, as far as I can see, it does speak volumes about the impact he's had. Which makes it all the stranger to me that there now seems to be credible reports, all the way from cult hero Team News and Ticks up to the likes of Fabrizio Romano, linking Arsenal to a move for Fulham's Joao Palinha. A player who, on the face of it, does a lot of the same things we spent £105 million adding to the squad last summer with Declan. For transparency, my perception of Palinha as a player before researching this video was broadly he's a defensive midfielder whose best qualities are breaking up play and having high numbers for tackles and interceptions. Someone who sits in your midfield and does their best work in front of the defence. So my first thought seeing those links were, we just, we just bought that, didn't we? Of course, they're both more than that, but that's what we were after in the summer. I remember Palinha's name coming up along with Caicedo, but it seemed like Rice was the first choice for that job and could add so much more too, and we went and got it done. So why do we need another one? And indeed, is he that player? Well, I learned quite a while ago with Mikel Arteta to stop pigeonholing players. Saka was a left back, Ben White was a centre back, Xhaka was a DM, so on and so on. So if he really is someone the club are after, maybe on a list with Douglas Luiz somewhere with credible reports, I think it's fair to try and consider the profile, see if there's something I've missed and consider what Mikel might do with him if he does sign, because it could well be something unexpected. Because let's be honest, and I'm going to shock you here, I think Mikel Arteta's talent ID might be better than mine. M maybe. The problem is, joking aside, I just can't quite make sense of it. There are elements of it that I can understand. Palinia is Premier League experienced, which is something Mikel loves, with seven out of his last 12 signings up to last summer being from within the league. He's a full Portuguese international with a wealth of experience in different leagues and countries. He's also, more importantly, a terrific player. So please don't get me wrong. He's got an eye for a goal, a better passing range than I'd previously given him credit for before watching him a bit more. But of course, he's known for being tenacious in the tackle and his numbers speak for themselves. He's in the 99th percentile for tackles per 90 in Europe's top five leagues and his overall tackling numbers are a joke. He holds all sorts of records, including the most tackles and interceptions in the Premier League last season. I'd liken him to a more physically robust, taller Lucas Torreira, and that is a compliment. In the sense that Palinha has that same kind of high intensity of focus that Torreira had to win the ball back in that kind of hunched, dogged way. Declan Rice takes it from you in a different way, with more anticipation and glide, where Palinia is harry and hustle, which probably explains their numbers for their fouling too. He's also absolutely everywhere. Look at his heat maps and you'll see this guy will run all day for you and has that kind of inevitable gene, scoring a lot of quite important late goals for Fulham. Deceptively tall at 6'3", Bayern Munich's interest to the tune of 65 million euros is testament to the regard that Pellini has held in around Europe. So I can understand why Arsenal hold an interest in the player, and I'm sure that they do. But look a little closer and consider how he'd fit in, and I think it starts to break down a bit. One of my problems with Palinia is his passing is a little bit simplistic. It's not bad, necessarily, it's just not particularly inventive when you compare him to the best sixes in the world. Whenever he wins it back, it feels like he usually plays the very simplest pass he can, without necessarily taking the time to pick his head up and assess his options or make the pitch bigger. It's perfectly valid to have a player who does that, as he so clearly has a superpower, you just need to complement him with someone who has a bit more on-ball personality and a wider sense of awareness of what's going on around them. But if Palinia does sign, he will play alongside Rice. And that doesn't really feel like a compliment. A midfield of Rice and Palinia plus one, unless that plus one is the next coming of Lionel Messi, feels a little bit heavy duty and maybe not adept enough to play the final ball, for example, for my liking, as much as I think Rice's passing is underrated. Palinia, aged 28, isn't coming in to get some minutes off the bench as Rice's understudy, so he's going to play with him if he comes, and I just can't see how that works. Playing with both Rice and Palinia is maybe suitable for an attritional European night away from home, but I think you need someone who has different facets to their game as well. Look at their radars for all-round midfield play over this season so far, courtesy of Data MB. There's decent all-round metrics being considered, stuff like progression, dual percentage, forward passes, all things you'd want your midfielder doing, and Rice pretty much wipes the floor with him, or certainly is the more rounded player. His passing and carrying numbers are really worrying if you're going to be one of the midfield three at Arsenal, looking for 60-70% to 70 possession and trying to control the match. To put that all into perspective, I want to ask you a question. How good was Francis Coquelin on the ball?
Exactly. He wasn't terrible, but here's a radar, courtesy of the legendary Scott Willis, comparing Coquelin's 2014-15 season to Palinia this season, with the blue representing him and the red representing Coquelin. Look at those passing and carrying numbers and tell me you feel encouraged that this guy can come in and deliver for us in possession, which, let's be clear, would be one of his main tasks. Because it's worth considering, how does Palinia translate to Arsenal? Fulham's defence is suspect at times, conceding the fourth most open play XG in the league despite being 14th, and he's being asked to do very different things than he would be for us. It's not as simple as copy and pasting. He would have a more active role on the ball, and we have to consider that. There's an element of risk and a question mark around translation in all transfers, of course, but even his best qualities feel a little bit tenuous and unnecessary to be adding to this Arsenal team. Have we struggled this season to control games? No. Have we struggled to win the ball back? Quite the opposite. Adding this type of midfielder feels in some ways regressive to me. As exciting as it might be to feel we are literally bulletproof at the back, adding to what is already the best defence in the Premier League. Then there's the deal aspect of it all. His wages are fine, but he's 29 next summer and would presumably want a four to five year deal, understandably, leaving us potentially tied to him into his early to mid 30s. He's only just signed a new deal with Fulham in September and to go and get him in January, putting aside all the footballing reasons, which are more subjective of course, just seems impossible. Fulham accepted 65 million euros in the summer but failed to sign a replacement so he didn't go, but that's now their benchmark. With a new deal selling to another Premier League club in the middle of the season, we're talking 80, 90 million before we even get in the room. Maybe they go lower, but no thanks. If the market rate is set by Chelsea, we're a word I won't say on this channel. And if you're in favour of it, let me ask you this. Is he coming in to play six over Declan Rice? Really? Or is he in the six with Rice in the eight, which pushes out either Kai Havertz, a bloke we just dropped 65 million pounds on in the summer and who seems to have finally found a bit of form, or is he pushing Erdegaard out, Mikel's son? I just can't see it happening. Let alone the pathways he potentially block of Vieira, Smithrow, Luis Skelly, Winieri, Trossard, Patino, so many more. We all want a shiny new toy, but we want those toys to have as few consequences as possible. Finally, we have to look at this from a squad building perspective too. And as January approaches, fans are considering their options. What midfielder do we want? Do we want to go for Osserman now or in the summer? Do we need another winger? Look in the comments of any of my videos, any Arsenal related content online, and that's the general chat. And I feel like I'm going mental. Guys, we are one injury away from Cedric Suarez. We're sleepwalking into a potential defensive crisis, and I don't feel any sense of panic. Mikel had said that we are very short at the back already, and that was before confirmation that Tomiyasu is out for a while now too with a calf injury, so it's looking really concerning in our back line. We need a defender. It's non-negotiable for me. We have to get something done early in January, and that's where I think we should be focusing our time and energy and resources on as a club. We can't rely on Timber and shouldn't rush him back regardless, even if he's projected by some to be back in mid-February. Saliba's played every minute this season. Zinchenko has his injury issues. White's been out. Kivio didn't look too settled the other night. Mikel seems reluctant to use Walters, and Cedric is Cedric. Tommy Asu's off to the Asian Cup too. There's so much to consider. White, Saliba, Gabriel, Kivior, Zinchenko. One of those goes down, specifically Saliba or White, and we're having some very uncomfortable conversations yet again for the third season running. So returning to Palinia, I don't see it happening. I don't think his on-board quality is good enough. I don't think the price makes sense. I don't think the deal makes sense. I can't see what position he plays. I don't think it's a good use of resources. I'd simply echo everything I've said so far. But I do hold one suspicion. Sometimes, when we're linked with someone, I just get a sense that it might not be the straightforward move we expect it to be. It might be in aid of a shift in how we play, or be part of a more elaborate idea. For example, I think Havertz's signing might be with a nod to a future second striker role as a backboard to a different style of nine. I wonder if when scouting White, his role on the right side of a back three for Brighton was a future consideration despite him playing centrally for us initially. Jurian Timber was ostensibly signed to play on the right, as he had for Ajax, but started on the left. So on and so on. The point is, we never actually know what the plan is for a player. And beyond that, no one, not even the coaches and the people making the decisions, know how a player will develop or what dynamics will appear on the training ground that no one could have planned for. With that engine, that tackling technique and volume, his frame and his eye for a goal, who says he can't be a defensive option? We need a defender. What if Palinia is the defender? The response might be, he's a midfielder, that doesn't make any sense. But ask yourself where Zinchenko in this side spends most of the time in possession. He's a midfielder. 
If Mikel thinks Paulinho has the engine, the technique, the frame to play somewhere else, he's definitely a coach I can see being willing to take on that gamble and ask different questions of an opposition. As a fullback, stopping transitions early, playing the simple pass, maybe he's perfect for a new evolution in our defence. It might not even be as a fullback. As recently as 2019, he played at centre-back for Sporting. Positions in football are going through an overhaul. What position is Phil Foden? What position is Bernardo Silva? Trent Alexander-Arnold. It's about role, instruction and profile. And Paulinho certainly has some outstanding attributes, which, if used creatively, could be very interesting to add to us. We'll have to wait and see, but if anyone could pull that kind of integration off, I do believe Mikel might be willing and able if that's what he has in mind. I'm not saying it for sure, but I do wonder. Because let's be honest, no one is taking our boy Declan's place. If you like The Different Knock and want to see more, you can access our bonus content on Patreon and YouTube memberships for just £3 a month.